My name is James Heckman. I'm an economist at the University of Chicago, where I've been for many years, actually. There's an emphasis on early childhood. In my own work, I've emphasized a lot early childhood. But I want to make amendments to that early work, and I've begun to make those amendments to early work. Because if we looked at the psychology of development of human skills, we recognize the early years are extremely important, especially important for developing cognition, as it turns out. But it also turns out that later in the adolescent years, after puberty, after time when you start gaining all kinds of adolescent notions, literally there is a whole neuroscience of how the prefrontal cortex is developing at that time. And so we have a, a, a psychology and science of the teenage years, which unfortunately has not yet been fully integrated back with the early childhood years. It's crazy. I mean, it's, again, you know, we see specialization has really great values. You know, the more we know on each of these things, the better. But we have to put it together, too. And what happens is we know that there's an early period of life where you can actually teach a lot of these basic skills. You lay the foundation. There's this concept that I've pioneered and worked with others on called dynamic complementarity. But what it means is that skill builds skill that if I have a motivated, skilled, a curious child, that child will learn more and will learn more over the rest of the life of the child. So it just accumulates. It's very, very much a process of dynamic, of dynamics, literally, of dynamic complementarity, the early skills cross-fostering the later skills. But what we also have to appreciate is that as children get older and as we become adults from being children, we also develop new skills and we develop new identities and develop new concerns. And so in the teenage years, 13 and 14 and 15, we do see encouraging, I mean, we see signs in children becoming much more you know, unstable, unsure of themselves, because they're now trying to establish an adult identity, which is very unsteady. They don't know what they say. And it's at that stage we know that mentoring, encouraging, providing advice and guidance it's a form of this parenting I was talking about, a form of scaffolding, but it's an age-modified form. It's now the children are playing a different role. So we found, for example, in studies that were done in Germany, for example, in studies done in the United States and many countries, that the adolescents, when they're the disadvantaged adolescents, when they're encouraged, they have a mentor, even visiting a few hours a week, just a mentor to talk to, especially children without parents, or especially without a father in particular for boys, but also more generally, we found that when we encourage those children, when we actually give them advice and guidance, the mentoring is a kind of adult or at least adolescent parenting. And that parenting then builds successful lives. So we can see in randomized control trials, in a series of studies, that that mentoring has substantial effects. What it means then is that there are at least two periods of productivity in the life of the child, the adolescent years and the early years. And that's not to say nothing is going on in the intermediate years, but there's a lot going on in those two years. And what's important is for remediation purposes and for thinking about children who were neglected in the early years, who didn't get that attention, that you can actually see some way to guide them and successfully towards uh, successful adult lives still. So there's a, there's a dynamics, there's a whole life cycle of skill acquisition, but also emergence of the possibilities of skills. You know, for example, the, the whole question of identity and personality changes around puberty. We know that. You know, girls and boys both, they, they're adopting different roles, they're considering themselves in different ways. And with that then, developing different attitudes about themselves and others, and encouraging positive development in those dimensions is an important part, I think, of education and instruction. And I think we are starting to find that uh, being implemented into policy. I'm not saying these have been successful. There's a lot of experimentation. In, in the United States, Obama, when he was president, was very supportive of something called becoming a man. The evidence on that is quite mixed. Uh, it was an encouraging program for youth, male black youth primarily, trying to encourage them uh, by mentoring to gain, you know, take positive steps. But there has been some positive evidence too. In Liberia, when this program was instituted, it did have long-term effects. So we're experimenting. I mean, this is a case where 
we, we, A, we have to appreciate that there are these multiple dimensions. B, we have to understand that they become their so-called critical and sensitive periods. And, you know, like, like the Bible says, you know, a time and a place for everything. Well, there is a time and a place for everything. And there's more emphasis. There's more, there's more, there's more you know, for the, for the very young, I mean, teaching reading and teaching that kind of cognitive notion, very powerful, very, very powerful. Not exclusively, but I'm saying that's very delicate. And we know from the early studies of language that if you don't get any exposure to language by the time you're six or seven, it'll be almost impossible to learn to speak a modern language. We've seen those studies. The so-called wild child, you know, that's in France and movies have been made about it. But it's true that there are these studies of children locked up in closets in Los Angeles and the Romanian infants and so forth and so on. So there are critical periods. If we just miss them, then we're gone. So there is something really important there. But also we should recognize that there's a, the human development is much richer than that. It's not all at the beginning. In beginning is very important, so I don't want to turn my back on my previous work. But I also want to say, let's go forward. And then we go into the later years. This is the part that's interesting. I have a colleague, now dead, but he was a very important person who talked about neuroplasticity. His name was Huttenlocker, Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, who was at the University of Chicago. And he pointed out that neurons and plasticity was forming into people into their 70s and 80s and 90s that there was still this neuroplasticity, that we're still learning, maybe not at the same rate and maybe not with the same flexibility. We know the flexibility changes when you're older. It's just a fact. But we do also know that there's uh, still learning going on. And so I think the challenge in the future going forward is to think about lifetime learning and maybe get away from the idea that learning is all just concentrated in one block of time and learning is of a particular form and it's measured in a certain way. I think we're going to end up maybe in 50 years with a notion of a much broader notion of what, what we learn, how we learn, what the multiple skills are, and what the sensitivities are at different ages and what we can do. And so we do know that there are ways, even for people with Alzheimer's disease, people who actually have serious challenges, we know that there are certain exercises that can be performed, they can perform, that can at least sharpen their abilities in various ways. So we're learning. If you understand the population you're sampling, you should understand that almost every, every psychological trait, almost every measurement is a behavior, even an IQ test. It's the behavior and your response to a raven's pattern or to some kind of pattern that you see in the data or in the, in the puzzle you're confronted with. And it's that, that kind of, be, the, it's the, those kinds of behaviors that constitute what we call our measures of skills. I just want us to appreciate that and then to understand two things about those behaviors. One, that the behaviors are going to be influenced by who else is watching and listening, the incentives that people have to respond in one way or the other. That's being studied, studied very actively. And then the other part is that, again, the behavior is partly interactive. So that, for example, like in these games of dictator games and these games of social interaction, where I give you money and then I, I, you, I see how much money you give me back and so forth and so on, those kinds of reciprocity games elicit something about me and about you. But then what we're understanding is something that's even more general than the person. It's the situation and understanding the nature of the interaction. And when we recognize that society is organized as a set of these interactions, we then go well beyond the individual to try to say, well, you have this person, A, with B, and who is A, who is B, why do they interact this way, what are the conditions, and the behaviors are then expressions. So frequently, we'll just look at B or A, and what we should do is see A, B, C, and the entire environment, because that's the nature of the response we're getting. So we're all measuring behaviors. People don't think of an IQ test as a behavior, but it is. There was a study done many years ago now about IQ tests. And people said, okay, the black-white gap in IQ was one standard deviation, 15 points on a standardized scale, one standard deviation. But then somebody said, look, suppose these black kids just aren't interested in this test. Suppose they're just, they're not, they're not motivated. Well, suppose I give them, and this is what the experimentalists did, I give each, I give a child one M&M, a chocolate candy, 
for each correct answer on the IQ test. How would that change the IQ score of the blacks? Two-thirds of the gap between blacks and whites was eliminated by incentivizing them to respond to that test. That's pretty striking. <laughs> and, and if we do that, then we recognize, look, we're only, it's only half the story. Kids go into the very highly motivated middle-class children go in. They want to be smart. They have all these internal goals. The other children aren't as motivated. So every one of these tests that we think of as a test, like a PISA or something, all of those tests, I, I've written some papers on this subject, a number of papers, where we say, what, what constitutes the test? And it's, just, it's partly IQ, yes, but it's also partly motivation, and it's partly the ability, perseverance. You know, there's a whole science now, a group of people in Holland working on this question about understanding how perseverant people are by looking at how many questions they leave unanswered on an IQ test. I mean, that's not the reason why they did the IQ test, but you, what you find is that these kids are basically, you know, just they don't care. Right? And if you incentivize them, they care. So there's a big literature on incentivization. The behavioral economists have been very good at that. They, they actually are already constructing their laboratory experiments and their field experiments now with incentives. But we need to study what they are. What are the incentives? Why do you, as a black kid, you know, living in a ghetto with other kids who are not all that aspiring and maybe all of you feel hopeless, why you answer, you give you a test, well, why do you want to answer the test? You know, is it some, the belief is that somehow there's an intrinsic motivation, that we're all going to be equally motivated, independent of our circumstance. It's not true. We just, we know that the IQ test I just gave you was an example, but there are many other examples about how you can look at behavior on grades for, uh, and tests and other kinds of aspects of, of mentoring, of not of mentoring, of measurement, I'm sorry, of uh, monitoring the nature of the, uh, uh, the, the question. So the PISA test is certainly open to manipulation. I promise you, if you look at PISA, and we did something like this, not with PISA, but with another test that's common in Europe uh, than PISA. And this test, we found that about a third to a half of the scores in those tests were not related to IQ. They were related to personality traits, that people who were more conscientious did better on the test, people who were more curious did better, and on and on and on. That's why we need a deeper understanding of these traits to really start thinking about. But I, I think the danger that's happened with PISA is a danger that Horace Mann was worried about that if we measure people only on these narrow sets of traits, it's easy to say, oh, this is a very successful. You know, we have a scheme, we can compare everybody. It, you know, these discussions when you compare Shanghai to Chicago or something, it's crazy. The people are getting tested in Shanghai are these children who are very elite. They're going to all these instructional classes at night. They're studying like crazy, as many of the more elite Chinese students do. And if you were to take that same test to Lhasa in Tibet or Gansu out in West China, the scores plummet immediately. And that's been studied, actually, where you just change the venue of the PISA test. So there's not a universal battery. And this idea, to me, one of the most pernicious notions about the test, the PISA test, is this idea of a universal score. It's very appealing to a person's trained in science. I'm trained in science. I have a background in physics. I love hard science. But I also recognize you have to be careful about the use of those measures. And to rely on them so exclusively and to start rate, it's a natural bias. So in the 1980s, the governors of the, uh, of the states, including Bill Clinton, who later became president, there was something called The Nation at Risk that was published. And it was a document about the fact that American schools were failing. And what were they doing? They were basing it all on these achievement test scores, the NAEP. And they're saying, oh, we're not doing very well on the NAEP. The NAEP, it's just one of these achievement tests. It's only part of the story. It didn't say how people were motivated, nor did it give us a handle about how, what we should do about it. And then the other part is when you take a test score, there's a whole literature, which some groups have uh, here, even in France, uh, and, and certainly in Paris anyway, have emphasized, which is so-called value-added models. So you see, I rate a teacher by how much the class PISA scores improve from one year to the next. Well, that's crazy. There's no natural metric. 
I mean, it's like it's like temperature. I mean, what do we use? You know, at least we agree that there are certain linear types of transformations on temperature. But I could record Fahrenheit squared, or you know, uh, you know I could do uh, metric units cubed. Uh, anything that keeps the monotonicity, make sure it's over the scale. I can preserve it. And those, it's comparing apples and oranges. And so literally, a whole subject has emerged that's been encouraged by many international organizations that I think is dangerous in the sense of misguiding the structure of, 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 of measurement and evaluation. And, and the, but value added is dangerous. It's been abandoned, by the way, by many people. Gates, I think, sunk. Was it Gates or Zuckerberg? I think Gates spent $50 million in Massachusetts about 10 years ago, and they threw it out the window. The idea was we're going to evaluate who was a good teacher by the value added of the test. But the trouble is there's no natural unit. You know, it's like saying, I mean, I can weigh you on a scale, and that's a natural unit. You're so many pounds, so many kilograms, and so, but I don't know what you're, what are you in terms of your knowledge? If I learn 10 more words, am I 10% smarter? Am I 1% smarter? Am I 0% smarter? I should have learned 100 words. There's no scale, and yet the assumption is of a scale. This is an old idea, by the way. I'm not, this is not new to me. This goes back from the very beginning of educational testing. Every serious scholar who created these tests has always mentioned these limitations and asked that they be taken into account and that we use other inventories. So for example, like the achievement tests that are used in America, the uh, ACT and so forth, the, the creator of that test has long essays that he wrote that we should use things like grades, we should do things like reports on deportment, uh, absenteeism, uh, various other measures, just if we stay within the school system, and then we should use other measurements. That, to me, is the frontier of educational. And we're able to do it better now because we have such better monitoring technology that we can actually now use multiple sources of data. And, uh, for example, I, I'll quit talking, but, I, but one thing that I find very, very inspiring is that we looked, we, a group of us at the University of Chicago, with the cooperation of the Chicago Public Schools looked at records of absenteeism and records that were kept as part of the administrative structure of the school. So it wasn't really the grade, it wasn't really the grade or the test score, but it was bit about behaviors, how many people were detained. And we could see, we could then use that as measures of social and emotional skills. And they were very predictive when we went out. And so those, the data are there. It's just a question of trying to create a an infrastructure to put those data together in a creative way. Very exciting. <laughs>